Thank you. I'd like to thank Andrew Finesse and James Larkin and the whole team at Marsden for inviting me to give this Professor Martin Gore Memorial Prize lecture. It is a great honour to give a lecture in his name. He was an incredible leader in the field of oncology and in fact has mentored many leaders who are current leaders in the field of oncology now. He was also renowned to be a great colleague and a great thinker. So with that, it's with great pleasure that I dedicate uh, this lecture to his memory. My name's Professor Georgina Long. I am a clinician, scientist and academic at Melanoma Institute Australia and the University of Sydney. And we have a single focus goal, and that is to achieve zero deaths from melanoma. Now, internationally across the world in the last uh, decade, we have moved forward in leaps and bounds, particularly with drug therapies. So on the left here is one of my patients treated with targeted therapy combination BRAF and MEK inhibition. And on the right is a patient of mine treated with anti-PD-1 based therapy. He has uh, neck lymphadenopathy and liver metastases. Now both patients had a complete response, but the patient on the left who had very aggressive disease, he was ECOG-3 when I met him, only weeks to live. He lived for 12 months and the patient on the right is now alive and well and melanoma free seven years down the track. So uh, the drug therapies are very well tolerated, particularly the immunotherapies. On the left here are Adam and Josh. Uh, they are also stage four melanoma patients who were treated with combination immunotherapy and are melanoma free six years down the track. And that's uh, Mia and Grace, Mia on the right and Grace on the left, sitting on their father's laps. Uh, these men have gone on to have normal full lives, working full time and uh, a lot of family time. On the right is Bert, another tribute to well how well tolerated these drugs are. This is Bert at his 101st or 102nd birthday, but at 101, he was treated with anti-PD-1 therapy, only a few cycles. His first scan showed a complete response and he hasn't had any treatment since. And this is him at 105, alive and well, still living alone, still independent in all his activities of daily living. And that's him on radio giving an interview. Regrettably, not everybody does as well as these patients I've outlined. Uh, this is another patient of mine who sadly died within a few weeks of his diagnosis of stage four melanoma. I had been looking after him for a couple of years. He'd had high risk resected stage three melanoma, was on the BMS 915 study, progressed locally, resected, had adjuvant dibrafenib and trametinib, and then uh, progressed very suddenly with fulminant liver metastases and failure. So we still have some work to do. So I'm going to be talking about how we may achieve towards or achieve our goal of zero deaths from melanoma. So this is really about towards zero deaths from melanoma. The way I've structured this lecture is where are we now? the things we've learnt along the way and how we can raise that bar. So where are we now? I like to show these uh, overall survival curves at the start of any talk where we are talking about the future because this is where exactly where we are now, over five years down the track from all the phase three randomized trials of drug therapy in advanced melanoma. So shown here, we have the BRAF and MEK inhibitors, uh, dibrafenib, trametinib there in green. We have a bunch of curves in the middle, anti-PD-1 combined with anti-CTLA-4, and then anti-CTLA-4 alone in purple. At one year, they all have a very similar overall survival of 70 to 75%. A single agent anti-CTLA-4, the first agent to show an overall survival in phase three trials, has a one year survival of 47%. Then we see a pattern emerge from two years and beyond, and it's persistent and consistent with the anti-PD-1 therapies having higher landmark overall survival, particularly combination anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4, followed by anti-PD-1 alone, followed by the BRAF and MEK inhibitors. Now, when comparing overall survivals like that, we do have to be careful because Trials that were conducted earlier on, there are not so many subsequent therapies to bump that overall survival up. 
So let me give you an example. Lipilumumab in 2010 had this overall survival curve, but in from the Keynote 006 trial, it has this overall survival curve, clearly much better. And that's because a third of the patients, or nearly a third, had subsequent anti-PD-1 monotherapy. So really to compare where we are now and, and really look at the value of our drug therapies and compare across trials, which we shouldn't do, but we do because we need to make decisions in the clinic. These are the landmark progression-free survival. So this is really unbiased because a patient comes off these curves if they progress or change treatment or, or die. So uh, we see exactly the same pattern. Again, the BRAF and MEC inhibitors seem to do a lot better in the first 12 months, but by about one year, we see similar progression-free survival landmarks. But when we look at the pattern from two years and beyond, again, a persistent uh, higher landmark progression-free survival for combination anti-PD-1 with anti-CTLA-4 shown here at five years. So 36%. 29% and 19% for combination targeted therapy. So that's where we are today. We also have used these drugs in adjuvant therapy in high risk stage three melanoma, where we resect the tumor and then give a fixed uh, length of time of treatment, 12 months. And we have seen incredible results there across the board with dibrafenib and trametinib combination therapy, and nivolumab, this was versus ipilumumab, and then pembrolizumab versus placebo, all phase three randomized trials, and approximately a 50% reduction in the risk of recurrence if we compare back to placebo for all three drug therapies. Without going into too much detail, I have done something I did similarly for the advanced melanoma patients. I have uh, overlaid the curves, but this is stage 3B and 3C from AJCC 8th, uh, 7th edition. And we can see a very similar pattern in that uh, the BRAF and MEK inhibitors have the highest relapse-free survival, followed by anti-PD-1, followed by anti-CTLA-4, which are all superior to no therapy. But around the two year mark, we see a change in the relapse free survival. And we're yet to see the four and five year data in this comparative way to see what the landmarks are. But a uh, very interesting pattern that might be what we see in stage three melanoma. Nevertheless, we're seeing a huge improvement in the relapse free survival uh, for patients receiving either targeted therapy, nivolumab or pembrolizumab for 12 months after resection. The phase two immunode study, another adjuvant trial, but this time in stage four melanoma, showing impressive curves, although small numbers, we still see impressive curves for a randomized trial uh, with nivolumab combined with ipilumumab in blue showing the most superior relapse-free survival in resected stage four melanoma, a two-year uh, relapse-free survival of 70%, followed by 42% for nivolumab and 14% for placebo. Uh, just to note with that, that was nivolumab and ipilimumab treated at the advanced melanoma dosing strategy. So ipilimumab at three milligrams per kilogram and the median number of doses patients received on that arm was only two due to toxicity. And then more recently, just presented at ESMO 2021, we've seen adjuvant pembrolizumab versus placebo show a very early benefit in resected stage 2B and 2C melanoma. At this very first analysis, we had not expected a positive result at all. It was a bit of a surprise um, to see a, a hazard ratio of 0 0.65 uh, at this early juncture. So that's a 35% risk reduction. We anticipate that if the curves show the similar pattern, that is an increasing in the separation of the curves from one to three years, then we would expect that hazard ratio to, to reduce further. So possibly below 0 0.65. Adverse events are shown there again, as expected, uh, grade three, four adverse events were highest in pembrolizumab, but are manageable and discontinuation in about 15% of patients on the pembrolizumab arm due to toxicity, whereas there's only 2.5% in the placebo arm. 
relapse free survival in, in Keynote 716 adjuvant trial uh, what favored pembrolizumab across most subgroups. Now, again, it's very early. We've only got a follow up of about 13 months. So I think we need to watch this space to make any decisions about subgroups that may not benefit. For example, T4B, we see that the confidence interval crosses one and the hazard ratio does not seem as high. However, a word of caution, I would wait uh, more time because we did not expect a positive result at this time. Patterns of recurrence, quite astounding for stage two melanoma. Stage two melanoma is often thought of as not as high risk, but in fact, stage two B and two C melanoma carries a similar risk to three B melanoma. Uh, the pattern of recurrences, surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, nearly half of them were distant recurrences. So this is the natural history on the placebo arm of the 82 recurrences seen, half of them were distant. So this is quite aggressive disease. So there are two questions remaining, and that is, does adjuvant therapy reduce the risk of new primary melanomas? And I'm also going to show you a risk predictive tool in a minute or, or a bit later. And also, do we need to treat now or can we treat later? So uh, this again is Keynote 716. This time it's a sensitivity analysis, including new primary melanomas as an event, as a recurrence event. And you can see that the hazard ratio is slightly improved suggesting that maybe there is some prevention of some primary melanomas with adjuvant anti-PD-1 therapy. So this other unanswered question is, what if we, rather than resect and treat, we resect and watch and only treat if it becomes stage four or widespread metastatic disease? Do we cure the same percentage of patients? So in the Keynote 716 study and also its sister study, Keynote 054, which was Pembro versus placebo in stage three melanoma, uh, the uh, crossover design will examine this. And that is patients who have recurred on the placebo arm can cross over to pembrolizumab. And those who recurred six months after their last dose of pembrolizumab in the active arm can also cross over to pembrolizumab. And the primary endpoint in that case will be overall survival. So this will answer the question. So what have we learned over this last decade? So what we do know, uh, the patients that do well, this bunch at the end of these progression-free survival curves who are progression-free at five years have very similar features across all drug therapies. They usually have had a complete response or they're enriched for complete responders, I should say, a low volume disease, normal baseline LDH, and a low number of metastatic sites. So we're in the midst of using all the knowledge that we have accumulated in the last decade with drug therapies to uh, make risk calculator or prediction tools that can be used online. In fact, uh, we have at melanoma risk.org.au a suite of prediction tools for early melanoma and we will be adding a tool for advanced melanoma and this is shown here on the left uh, Anesh Silva who is now a junior faculty at Melanoma Institute Australia has been spearheading this calculator with our statistician Dr Sarin Lowe and so if we take a patient with these clinical baseline clinical features easy to get straight off your blood form uh, your your scans we can calculate that this patient with M1C, M1D, liver mets, looking at first line therapy and a high LDH has a two year PFS of 30% for combination anti PD1 and anti CTLA4. I'm going to show you another risk predictor tool. This is for early melanoma. So, harping back to Keynote 716 and talking about whether anti PD1 can prevent subsequent primary melanomas. Uh, let's just have a look at this risk prediction tool. So if you're a female and you're aged, let's say 45, and you've only had one previous uh, melanoma uh, and you have, it was on your legs and you fill out more things. I'll just fast forward a bit. Let's go to, uh, you tan lightly, you have a few moles, uh, you've never had genetic testing, you don't have a lot of sun exposure, you have no first uh, degree relatives with melanoma, you've got a 9% nine, 9 risk of a subsequent melanoma. So that's a tool that's readily available uh, online. So going back to looking at what we've learned over the last 10 years, now let's turn to tissue biomarkers. I, I look just 
at clinical biomarkers, now let's look at tissue biomarkers. So we know that PDL1 is somewhat associated with a good response to anti PD1 therapy. This is taken from the uh, Keynote 006 Pembrolizumab versus Ipilimumab in advanced melanoma. And we can see in green the Pembrolizumab response by the immunohistochemistry score of PDL1. So zero, no PDL1. And we can see that the more PDL1, the better the response. However, importantly, uh, if you don't have uh, any PDL1 expression, you still have a nearly 25% chance of response. So it's not a great biomarker, it's an associated uh, biomarker with response, but it's not highly sensitive or specific. Following um, or in the last decade, a lot of work's been done looking at anti-PD-1 blockade and this concept of the adaptive immune resistance that anti-PD-1 um, induces by interrupting that handshake between PD-1 and PDL one on the tumour and the T-cell. And then looking at the microenvironment, looking not just at PD-1 and PDL one expression, but other features of the tumour microenvironment. We now routinely use multiplex immunohistochemistry to look at this microenvironment. And this is just one example of a non-responder on the left and a responder on the right. Uh, the CD8 T cells are in green. Uh, the tumor is in brown and dappy in this bright blue. And you can see that we don't have, or there's a paucity of T cells. There is some PDL1 expression, but we're not seeing much of an infiltrate compared to a responder at baseline where there's a lot of uh, immune cells in the microenvironment. Then uh, using immunohistochemistry, multiplex immunohistochemistry, we can actually look at the distance between immune cells and the tumor cells to predict response. And we've shown that the intratumoral CD8 count in responders and non-responders and how close they are to the tumor. So within 20 micrometers of the tumor uh, predicts for a much greater response. And not just at the CD8 cells, but also T regulatory cells you can see have no uh, relationship in terms of their distance to the tumor with response or non-response shown in purple. But really it's the intratumoral and the peritumoral uh, CD8 T cells. Um, pan tumor, uh, tumor mutation burden interferon gamma signature, a study that was published in Science in 2018. Uh, really interesting short article across the pembrolizumab program. And really look at this last column here basically showing that if you combine tumor mutation burden and interferon gamma signature in blue, you see this association with better progression-free survival across all tumors, particularly head and neck and best with melanoma. But again, it's pretty blunt, just like PDL one it's associated, but it's not highly sensitive and not highly predictive. With all of this data though, came this concept of let's make a cold tumor hot. And I, have never really liked the simplicity of that concept. Let's make a cold tumor hot because it means that we can go off on tangents about and hypothesize about how drugs may actually work, uh, which are only really skin deep, pardon the pun. So IDO, I think is a, a beautiful example. There's a lot more work to be done on IDO, but uh, let me just walk you through this one example. So IDO is an enzyme that is secreted by macrophages and antigen presenting cells, and it catabolizes tryptophan to kinurinin. Now, the idea is that when you have high kinurinin, you switch to T regulatory cells and the CD8 T cells, the good ones, are apopto apoptose. So the idea is if you inhibited IDO, you could switch that around, increase your CD8 T cells and your natural killer cells and decrease your regulatory cells and therefore make a cold tumor hot. And this was a spectacular failure in the phase three trial of pembrolizumab plus or minus ipecatastat and IDO inhibitor, both for the progression-free survival with the hazard ratio of 1.0 and for the overall survival. Similarly, uh, TVEC, which did actually show an overall survival benefit in the OPTIM trial as single agent uh, in a very select population. But when you took it to the typical advanced melanoma population, this is the master key 265 trial, a phase three trial of pembrolizumab with TVEC or pembrolizumab with an intralesional placebo, 
we saw absolutely no benefit uh, from the TVEC in our typical advanced melanoma uh, setting. And the concept there was that the intralitional therapy would make a cold tumor hot and also that that would uh, enhance T cell memory somehow to affect other metastases. Now, um, uh, triple therapy. Uh, I did have a slide of showing that BRAF and MEK inhibitors enhance T cell infiltration into the tumor, those alone at about day three to day eight. And then the concept of combining a BRAF and MEK inhibitors, which in, in, induce this T cell infiltrate at day three to eight with anti-PD-1 may actually be a benefit. And there are three phase three trials that we've seen in the last five years. Keynote 022 of Pembro plus Dabtram versus Dabtram. Again, questionable control arm. Atizo plus Vem, Vemorafnib plus Cobimetinib versus Vemcobi is in the middle there. And Spartaluzumab and Anti-PD-1 plus Dabtram versus placebo. Now across these three clinical trials, you see there is a separation of the PFS curves. Um, we see overall response rates that are similar in both arms, driven mainly by the BRAF and MEK inhibitors, and similar sort of complete response rates. Although with time, we're seeing a slightly higher complete response rate uh, in the pembrolizumab triple therapy arm. And similarly with spartalizumab and dabrafenib and trametinib, just slightly higher, but really not statistically significant. Now, um, let's compare this to Ibinevo in BRAF mutant patients and we look at the two-year progression-free survival for this triple therapy, it's actually on par with ipilimumab and nivolumab. So, so really the triple therapy, which was difficult in terms of toxicity, really uh, has a, a clinically minor added benefit. Uh, with the, the control arm, we'd probably prefer to look at is anti-PD-1-based therapy, possibly not better than ipilimumab combined with nivolumab. And it's really questionable whether the BRAF-MAC actually enhance the anti-PD-1 therapy or whether it's a simple additional uh, benefit rather than a symbiotic or synergistic benefit. But one study has examined uh, this in a much more thorough way, although it's only phase two, and that's the SECOMBIT trial. So I'm just gonna show you the latest data presented at ESMO uh, from the SECOMBIT study, and this has three arms. Um, the first arm, arm A, patients are receiving targeted therapy into progression and then receive ipinevo. Arm B in green, they receive ipinevo first to progression and then targeted therapy. And then arm C is a sandwich arm where patients get a little targeted therapy, so hopefully enhancing T cell infiltration into the tumor, followed by ipinevo until progression and then targeted therapy if they progress. So basically, arm C is the same as arm B, except there's a little bit of encobini for eight weeks ahead of time. Now, it is only phase two with seven, approximately 70 patients in each arm, but interestingly, with time, we might be seeing what I showed you at the very get-go of this talk, that the targeted therapy first seemed to be quite good in the first 12 months, but when we're looking at three years and beyond, it seems that arm B and C may have the greater benefit. Although looking at the hazard ratio, comparing back to arm A, which is Encobini first, uh, followed by Ipinevo, um, the, the confidence interval for the hazard ratio does cross one, but we have to remember it's a small phase two. But let's keep watching these uh, landmark uh, progression-free survivals. So everything I've shown you to date is a little bit of a, a blunt hammer in terms of choosing patients. We've got clinical factors, high burden of disease versus low, uh, complete responders versus non-complete responders, um, PDL one in terms of biomarkers, um, T cell infiltrates, tumor mutation burden, interferon gamma, but really they're not highly sensitive and specific. So how can we get more highly sensitive and specific? So um, we need some refined tools to understand who is going to be those great responders and who needs our great attention in clinical trials. So how will we raise the bar? So first of all, I'd like to make an argument that we really need to focus on this cliff on the progression-free survival curves. These are the patients that do very poorly. 
And then we focus on the patients here that have what we call acquired resistance. They typically respond initially and then progress, although they tend to do very well in terms of overall survival. But before we actually look at the translational endpoints in the tissue from these patients, we really need to understand the clinical scenarios. So we we like to basket our patients into four different clinical scenarios when we're doing our translational work on their metastases. And this is again work from Inesh and Alex um, looking at these patterns of progression. So first of all, we've got this primary progression this is an independent individual patient, individual metastases. And we can see in this one patient, everything is growing with time. So this is primary progression. It's generalized and it's homogeneous. Is another example there. This patient um, has primary progression because we're seeing this outgrowth of these tumors. However, it's heterogeneous and it's solitary and oligometastatic progression. We then have a progression after a response, which is heterogeneous. So this is acquired resistance. Again, heterogeneous, solitary, oligometastatic. So these two are very similar. One is primary, one is secondary. And then the last is a secondary or acquired resistance, but it's homogeneous and generalized progression. So patients respond. This is an individual patient. All the metastases have responded and then all tend to become resistant and grow. Now at these extremes, we have targeted therapy. This is the classic progression pattern for targeted therapy and for immunotherapy, our classic progression pattern is this uh, homogeneous progression. So using our translational biopsy platform, we biopsy before uh, we treat with novel drug therapies, biopsy early during treatment and at progression where we can. Um, we always define that early during treatment biopsy as whether it's a responding or non-responding lesion. And then with our translational platforms, do various different analyses and experiments, including DNA, single cell RNA, uh, dissociates, cell lines, cytokine, TILS analysis, CITOF, et cetera, et cetera. They're various different techniques, but collecting basically frozen tissue, paraffin tissue and dissociates as well as blood and of course the microbiome. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of data that we're working on translationally to try and solve that problem of resistance to drug therapies. So this is work looking at a tumor resident CD8 positive memory T cells showing that uh, the presence of these T cells at baseline uh, predicts for a good response to anti-PD-1 therapy and prolonged response. Um, this is showing that these increase early during treatment. So from baseline to early during treatment on anti-PD-1 therapy, these increase significantly for responders, which are shown in red. Uh, exploring the good macrophage subsets. So sh shown here again, anti-PD-1 responders versus non-responders. Uh, this was taken from a slide I presented at ESMO recently. Um, and again, looking at our multiplex immunohistochemistry, where we can actually see the geography of how these tumor cells interact with the uh, macrophages. We've defined subsets of macrophages that are actually associated with a good response. And they are the CD14, CD16, CD68 positive uh, macrophages. Natural killer cells, again, um, uh, looking at our innate immune system, showing correlates with natural killer cells and response, certain subsets of natural killer cells that are associated with response. And in, in really interestingly, as you'd expect because of the way natural killer cells work, responders who have MHC class one loss, and typically people who have MHC class one loss in their melanoma uh, tend to not respond very well to checkpoint inhibitors. It's a mechanism of resistance. But if they have high natural killer cells, that resistance can be overcome. So again, giving us excitement about some of the natural killer cells therapeutic targets for resistant patients. Looking at another data set, this is baseline tissue taken from 92 patients treated with anti-PD-1 based therapy. This is work we did with our multiomics team in QIMR, Queensland, and as well as our team and our lab. Um, we really tried to look at that classic tumor mutation burden interferon gamma and tried to look at the outliers alone. 
maybe they would be a way that we could get clues about resistance. So shown here is the interferon gamma score on the y-axis, the tumor mutation burden on the x-axis, and those who respond or good responders are in blue, poor are in yellow. You can see that everyone with the high tumor mutation burden, high interferon gamma score does very well in this data set. But if we look at these outliers, so people with high interferon gamma who don't respond, or people with low interferon gamma who do, or people with low interferon gamma but high tumor mutation burden who don't. And so by focusing on these outliers, we call these biologically interesting patients, we've tried to understand resistance or excellent response in that context. Uh, another data set of 34 patients uh, who are non-responders, they all have primary resistance. And importantly, most patients, so this is RNA sequencing at the top here, looking at some specific drug targets. At the bottom is immunohistochemistry, CD8 and PDL1 expression. Most patients um, don't have CD8 or PDL1. They don't have T cells in their tumor when they're primary, have primary resistance. There is a small set though, with primary resistance that do. And so here we're seeing some therapeutic targets that might help that 10%, uh, 10, 10 to 20% of patients who do have T cells, but for some reason, uh, the T cells are not activated enough against the tumor. For example, lag three. Now I'll talk about lag three in a bit more detail. Uh, it's another checkpoint on our T cells, along with PD-1 and, and CTLA-4 and TIM-3. Um, very early studies uh, of anti-lag-3 relatlimab and nivolumab in patients who had progressed on PD-1 or PD-1, they weren't refractory, they were experienced, but had progressed. Uh, we saw that there was an enrichment for response in those who had lag-3 expression, although one patient uh, who had no lag-3 expression responded. Um, so this was the early data that then led to the phase three trial recently presented at ASCO 2021 and again at ESMO just recently, this uh, last month, showed this uh, very statistically significant hazard ratio of 0 0.75, a 25% reduction in the risk of progression with combination relatlimab and nivolumab over nivolumab. But there are a few questions. It was interesting that lag three expression did not select for patients to benefit from the combination. However, those with lag three expression did have a better progression-free survival with the combination um, and with PD-1 alone, uh, but it didn't select patients for the treatment. And grade three, four treatment-related adverse events, I've made a comparison here uh, with nivolumab and ipilimumab from checkpoint, uh, checkpoint 067. So we can see this drastic reduction in grade three, four treatment related adverse events across trial comparison, of course, with ipi nevo, but not quite as good as nevo alone, but overall a very tolerable combination therapy. So the question is, will this take over from PD-1 monotherapy with this data? I just want to remind people that the Ipinevo Checkmate 067 data at that sort of 12, 13 month follow-up, which is similar to what was presented at ASCO, it had a hazard ratio of 0 0.75 and, and almost exactly the same confidence interval actually was lower, 0 0.74, doesn't mean a lot, but just to show you that they're very on par. So the questions now are, when do patients need a combo over anti-PD-1? Will uh, relatlimab combined with nivolumab be chosen over nivolumab or pembrolizumab alone. How do we decide between nivolumab combined with ipilimumab versus this new combination? And also why was the Nevo monotherapy arm here in green? <clears throat> it didn't have a great 12 month PFS compared with previous studies, even though the baseline uh, characteristics of patients in this trial were very similar to previous studies. So going back to this, um, these non-responders, I showed you this before. I said there were a few with lag three, but they all had T cells. Our focus really needs to be in this group of patients who have primary progression with low TILs, low PDL1, and not much in way of expression of drug targets that we're currently working on. Um, so let's have a look at that a bit more closely. So this is another data set, 105 patients, again, anti-PD-1, anti-PD-1 plus CTLA-4, pre-treatment and some on-treatment biopsies. 
But what I really want to focus on are these non-responders and other targets. Interestingly, the hypoxia pathways and metabolic pathways were upregulated in these non-responders. So this brings me to another new, um, especially this hypoxia pathway combination being explored in melanoma. And this is pembrolizumab combined with lenvatinib in anti-PD-1 refractory melanoma. And this is truly refractory melanoma. Overall, with this combination, we saw an overall response rate of 21%, uh, 33% for those who progressed on combination PD-1, CTLA-4, 18% for those on PD-1 alone. But in this group of patients, 20% had an LDH more than two times the upper limit of normal. So this is a very, very poor group of patients. So to see even this level of activity was pretty startling. And I just want to show you some data from one of the patients from this trial. Uh, here's the duration of response from that trial. So there are some patients who benefit and have durable responses, although it, it remains to be seen who exactly this small group of patients are, and it is a small group. Um, so this is one such patient. So this patient had progressed on um, ipinevo, had multiple brain metastases, had even gone through whole brain radiotherapy. So this is three years ago, um, had multiple metastases, high burden of disease. And at baseline, this is a baseline biopsy, and this is an on-treatment biopsy. But what I want you to notice <clears throat> is that um, at baseline, we don't see much vessels. We don't see much uh, PD-1. PD-1 is the T cells or MHC. And so this is PD-1 in the middle here and MHC. But on treatment, the vessels elongate. They seem to so-called normalize. We get this massive infiltration of PD-1 and MHC class one expression. And this patient is um, disease-free, complete response, and is now two and a half years down the track having been on this clinical trial. So certainly there is a small group of patients that benefit and we need to understand what's going on. Could it be the hypoxia pathway that was active in this patient and normalizing the vasculature enabled the T cells to get in there, but that's just a hypothesis. So I just wanna finish off on neoadjuvant therapy. I think this is the, uh, way future, the, the way forward to test drug therapies in a wonderful translational program, uh, a platform, I should say. We know about adjuvant therapy. I outlined that before very early on. But neoadjuvant therapy is where we treat for six weeks. We resect. And then uh, this is the pathologist, Richard Scolia, who I work closely with at MIA. He's my co-medical director. And also we co-lead our translational laboratory together. But the pathology team will, will then categorize the response into complete. That's uh, no tumor cells left, near complete, that's 10% or less tumor cells, partial pathological response, that 50% or less of tumor cells, or no pathological response, so 50% or more of tumor cells remain after neoadjuvant treatment. Um, the International Neoadjuvant Melanoma Consortium, uh, huge membership, consultation with the FDA. We've written three papers, actually one is uh, about to be published, the first two have been published, pathological assessment, uh, the design of these clinical trials so that we're all doing similar things across the world when we are doing investigator-led neoadjuvant trials. The platform is quite simple, stage three, palpable, resist measurable disease, biopsy at baseline, start the neoadjuvant treatment, biopsy at day four to seven, completion dissection, and then the adjuvant part of the treatment. The primary endpoint being pathological response and secondary endpoint with the relapse-free survival. Now to make this a platform that is useful for drug development. So to cut drug development time, we have to prove that the complete pathological response rate correlates with relapse-free survival. And we did that with our pooled analysis. So shown here on the left is immunotherapy. Uh, and we can see any pathological response, partial, near complete or complete. And that's about 75% of patients treated with neoadjuvant ipinevo for two doses. Uh, have this flatlining of the relapse-free survival versus virtually no patients relapse or very few. Um, for targeted therapy, very different. Great to see that the complete pathological response correlates with the relapse-free survival, but we don't see the same thing as what we see with immunotherapy, but nice to see that difference. So at least for targeted therapies, uh, the complete pathological response is really important and that would predict for a good relapse-free survival. 
In the immunotherapy cohort, uh, one patient died, not due to a melanoma, um, but this is the immunotherapy cohort. Basically, all patients are alive and no melanoma-related deaths at the follow-up of this pooled analysis for those who had a partial response or better pathologically. Even within the non-pathological responders, we're seeing uh, responders uh, or people who have got a good relapse-free survival long-term, not what I don't mean responders, I mean good relapse-free survival. And we're looking into our non-responders to see what's happening there as to what that group are that do well. What we are seeing and looking at our non-responders here, the ones that have relapsed versus those who haven't, it's fibrosis level in the uh, completion lymph node dissection is strongly correlated with great outcome. Um, we're actually composing a predictive uh, tool uh, at the moment. We also see that interferon gamma and tumor mutation burden high, um, or 100% of those patients had a pathological response. Um, and either one of those present is a good predictor of pathological response. And about 40% of those with low interferon gamma and low tumor mutation, mutation burden still respond, meaning that this is a strongly uh, uh, specific test, not sensitive, but specific test for response that is interferon plus tumor mutation burden. Looking at the bacterial diversity in the gut, so inverse Simpson's uh, measure of bacterial diversity, we see that increased bacterial diversity is associated with a good pathological response, fewer uh, adverse events, toxicities. And if you put them together, you see a very big difference between the non-responders with toxicity and everybody else. We collected data on diet at the get-go prospectively in omega-3 and fiber is associated with the nice micro, uh, microbial uh, diversity. We then actually compared Australians and the Dutch um, from our trials, neoadjuvant trials, and we could not pinpoint a single uh, specific microbiota or species that was associated with great response but we did come up with community enterotypes. So it's the whole zoo and how the um, species interact. The worst community type being community type three, which is associated with a high fat fast food diet. So um, in interest of time, I'm going to briefly talk about um, neoadjuvant versus adjuvant treatment. And this is in humans from the Opassan uh, pilot study, 10 patients treated neoadjuvantly, 10 patients adjuvantly with ipimivo. And we see with longer term follow-up that maybe the overall survival is better at small numbers with neoadjuvant treatment supporting mouse work uh, that showed this, um, this. But particularly in humans, what we're seeing is those who receive neoadjuvant treatment get a much greater expansion of clones of T cells, this is in the dark blue compared to the dark red, uh, that were present at baseline. Um, so perhaps there is something about giving treatment neoadjuvantly that enhances the immunotherapy anti tumor effect or checkpoint inhibitor anti tumor effect. And there are la large randomized trials underway looking at adjuvant versus neoadjuvant treatment. The great beauty of neoadjuvant treatment is that the patient gets feedback. If they have a pathological response, particularly with immunotherapy, um, that is good news. We can prognosticate a lot better and much more refined way. We can also alter follow-up if patients have not responded so well or even change treatment. For example, BRAF and MEK inhibitors adjuvantly for those who've received neoadjuvant immunotherapy. We're also working towards decreasing surgery. So this is the Prado study, neoadjuvant ipilimumab, nivolumab. At the get-go, this is a large study, um, lot, very multidisciplinary, pathologists, surgeons, and medical oncologists. We highlight the biggest node with a seed, a radioactive seed, um, or a radio label, uh, uh, sort of a seed that's visible on CT scan. And then we treat with six weeks of ipinivo and we only remove the index node, that green uh, index node, not all of the nodes. If a patient's had a complete or near complete response, they get follow-up only, no further surgery. For those who've had a partial or uh, non 
pathological response, they get a total lymph node dissection. But the partial responders, since they do well with immunotherapy, get follow-up only. And the non-responders have their treatment altered adjuvantly. So not only are we altering treatment for non-responders, we're also giving less surgery to responders. And this is associated with a much higher quality of life. In fact, 61% of patients did not receive a total lymph node dissection uh, because they'd had a good response. Their quality of life was better and their symptom scores were lower. We've also seen recently nivolumab and relatlimab with a 73% AnyPath response, although these were enriched with BRAF wild type patients, which is different from our Opacin Neo and Prado neoadjuvant trials. And again, flatlining of the relapse free survival for the patients with a complete or near complete pathological response. We're now using biomarkers. This was presented just at ESMO. So now interferon gamma signature high versus low patients were randomized to these four different groups. Um, so interferon gamma high, either NEVO or NEVO plus an HDAC inhibitor, interferon gamma low, got NEVO plus HDAC inhibitor or triple therapy, epinevo with HDAC inhibitor. And importantly, what we saw, sorry about that, uh, this is the radiological response which did not predict well for the pathological response, which is shown below here. And importantly, we saw that interferon gamma high patients probably only need PD-1 alone. They had a 90% response. With the HDAC, it was 80%. Not sure that HDAC adds anything for these interferon gamma patient, low patients, and we're expanding this triple therapy cohort because this is approximately the same response we saw in interferon gamma low from our uh, PASA-NEO uh, trial. Again, uh, interferon gamma high signature patients tend to have a good response and tend not to recur. And again, treatment arms, uh, these, these treatment arms doing well are the interferon gamma high. So I think the take home message from this was we can use biomarkers to select patients. PD-1 alone may be all we need for interferon gamma high. Um, and we've got more work to do with interferon gamma low, and I'm not sure that HDAC inhibitors add anything for these patients. So to finish off on what this neoadjuvant therapy perfect model can do, um, we now have benchmarks for all our standard treatments neoadjuvantly. We can now test new drugs, get their path response rate, Look at now even biomarkers. So here in green are all these different combinations, nivolumab, ipilimumab, HDAC inhibitors that we've explored with the Netherlands. And we've got their any path response rate based on interferon gamma. But we've got a lot of other drugs that we're looking at in the neoadjuvant space. And we can compare back to our benchmarks to decide whether to take them forward for further development. We're cutting phase two development by from two years down to six months, which is pretty incredible. But even better, we get all that non-responsive tissue to try and find new therapeutic targets. So where are we now? Five-year overall survival, 50%. Uh, what have we learnt? We've learnt lots about responders, not enough about non-responders, and a lot of caution about phase three cl clinical trials before embarking on those. And that's where I think the translational focus can help before doing a phase three trial. We need to focus mechanistically on resistance rather than response. We can't just have associations. And neoadjuvant therapy, it's a critical translational platform, excellent for patients, great feedback, better prognostication, altering follow-up, but also uh, maybe more efficacious and less surgery, but it is a really uh, marvelous platform for both translational research and drug development. Um, I'm going to finish with where we're going now, where we test any stage patient, put their tissue and clinical factors into a black box, prognosticate will they recur or not. If they will recur, then select the right drug. I think that's where we'll get zero deaths from melanoma in the next decade. I'd like to thank you, um, again, a tribute to Professor Martin Gore, thank the patients and their families and all my colleagues working in this space. Thank you.